Happy New Year, Southwest. It is 2024, and that still sounds like a very large number I've never thought of before, but here we are. And my name is Rich, and I am thrilled to be worshiping with you here today. Very happy to be here, happy to be worshiping with you. And in this upcoming year, we are going to hear a lot of claims as to what is true. And unfortunately, politics and election years make people very volatile and sometimes downright angry. And so my encouragement to us as Christians entering this new year is that we not get sucked in uh, by all the negativity and sin of our culture, but that we be transformed by the truth that we have found, and that is in the person of Jesus Christ. He has redeemed and restored us, and uh, we are... Uh, transformed uh, to not be conformed to the patterns of this world, be transformed by renewing our minds and trusting in Him. So I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing together this morning. Happy 2024. Let's sing. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. Oh, I was breathing but not alive. With all my failures I tried. Too high, it was my doom till I met you. Oh, you called my name, and I ran out of that crib. Save my soul and your freedom is all it's all that I know. Yeah, the old made new Jesus when I made says, for the law of the spirit of life has set us free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. We can sing this morning and praise him because we are free. Let's join together. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes were open. Cause when you called my name.
I would like to introduce my friend, Rich Apetisano. We uh, worshiped together and ministered at the same church for four years in Buffalo, New York. So can we give Rich a nice, warm Southwest welcome this morning? Thank you. Thanks for being here, Rich. Introduce yourself after the service. Say hi to him. His lovely wife is somewhere, Bethany. Bethany's over here, so introduce yourself to either of those. They're visiting with us this weekend. So glad they're here. So glad you're here. Here at Southwest, we like to we like to get your attention by giving really loud, obnoxious noises in your ear. So now that you're awake, we're going to prepare our hearts for worship. We do so in a couple ways. We like to read scripture together, and we like to pray together. This month, we're going to focus on a portion of Psalm 71 as we prepare our hearts for worship. I will read the regular text. If you will join me in the bold text, I'd appreciate it. Psalm 71, 1 through 12 says this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Please join me. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me from hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. So use that passage as a prompting now to go before a holy, righteous, perfect God. Here at Southwest, we like to just give you space and time to commune with your heavenly Father. So we're gonna move into a moment of silent prayer. And I would encourage you, this is your time. Just get away from all the distractions of the world. If you've walked into this room with unconfessed, unrepented sin, now's a great time to do your business with God clean your heart, get ready to receive him, to receive his word. So let's just have a moment of silent prayer together as we prepare our hearts for worship. Let's do that as a family. Father, this passage reminds us that we are all conceived with a sinful nature and that left to our own devices, we will take the selfish and destructive route every time. So today we are reminded of our sinfulness as we are reminded of your holiness. And so we come into this place in 2024 with hearts and attitudes of humility and repentance. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love that you bestowed on us sinful creatures and you've provided a path through the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ, so that we may be in right relationship with the Holy God, we are eternally grateful. So today as we gather as a family, as we gather as Christ followers, not only remind us of your truth, but may our worship be a pleasing aroma unto you. Pray all these things in Christ's name, amen. Let's continue to sing this morning. 
continue to sing, let's look to the words in Romans 8, verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Let's find our hope in Jesus this morning. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Let's declare today, Christ alone, the cornerstone. Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord. He's the Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Let's sing this together.
this July, or July, January morning. Hello. Um, yeah, it's good to be with you and worshiping. That was beautiful, guys. Thank you. Um, my name is Jenna Erickson, and my family and I have been calling Southwest our home for, the, for almost three years now. Um, and like I said, it's a joy to be here. I know many of you have been here a lot longer than that, but for me, uh, to serve alongside and to worship alongside so many faithful and steadfast um, people has just been a joy. So this is one of my favorite times of the service where we get to talk and meet someone around you. So would you do that now? Take a couple minutes.
as you're making your way back to your seats, I just want to thank you again for being here. Um, those of you joining us online, it's good to be with you. Uh, we hope that this, this morning will be a blessing to you and maybe even a highlight of your week. Uh, speaking of blessing, we do have the Sunday registers to be filled out. If you could fill that out and let us know that you're here, but more importantly, um, fill out a prayer request. Our pastors and elders and staff members truly find it a blessing to be praying for the needs of the body throughout this um, next week or two. So take a minute to do that. Um, I just have two announcements this morning. The first is that there will be three new discipleship uh, classes um, starting today. There's one of them starting at 4 p.m. at the church. Um, all the info should be up behind me with a QR code that you can sign up and learn more about. Um, and then the next two classes start this Wednesday, um, coinciding with our Wednesday night programming. So if you're interested in discipleship, check those out. Uh, you do not need to sign up in order to come. And if you cannot make it tonight or even the first Wednesday, you can still come. So um, yeah, you don't need to sign up to do that. Just come when you are able. Um, and the next uh, announcement that I have is the men's prayer breakfast. Uh, the first one is going to be Tuesday, um, this coming Tuesday. I almost said July again. What is it with me? <laughs> January uh, 7th, and that's at 6.30. So if you are a man and you are looking to pray with other brothers in the Lord and deepen your faith, um, come expectant to do that. And now I would like to pray for you as you come up and give us the word. So would you bow your heads with me? Oh, holy God, thank you for this opportunity to come before you as a body of believers in our corner of the world. Thank you for the gift of your word that we get to open today um, that has stood the test of time, that has been the truth that we cling to, that um, has lasted all these years, and that is trustworthy and true. Thank you, God, that you are our Prince of Peace, that you shatter darkness, that you heal relationships, Thank you that we can be with you this morning and be fed. Just pray for Pastor Arnie as he stands and boldly proclaims your word. I pray, the Holy Spirit, that you would encourage him and anoint him now. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. And how's everybody doing? You look good. I, I mean, you really do. You look really good. Uh, 2024 will be kind to you, I'm sure. Um, thank you so much for being here. If you are new, I do want to welcome you. Also want to point you to what we call our worship guide. Uh, you may have gotten this on the way in. It does have an outline. This will tell you where we're going this morning. And you can take notes on this, or if you prefer, you can hit the QR code take notes online or take it electronically. If you did not get one of these or misplace yours and you do want one, put your hand in the air, leave it high in the air. Someone will get one of those to you. It's a resource for you. Uh, really glad uh, that you're here. You're with us today. As you notice, we've changed something. There's a, there's a yellow a portion of this, it says monthly fighter verse. I will talk about that here in a few moments. Um, but this is a resource for you. You might want to take one of those uh, to follow along this morning. I am excited to be back with you and to be here in 2024. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so glad to be here. And this morning, we are fighting. Yes, I said fighting. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to church where we're going to fight. Not physically. And, and I know what the Bible says, right? Turn the other cheek, you know, be kind to your neighbor, love one another, all those things. But this morning we're talking about another fight. 
We're talking about what we need to be as individuals and as a church and as a family. We need to, we need to fight. And just, just as we get started, so, so I'm going to set up this fighting mentality here for a moment. I think there are good fights that we can enter, and there are things in this world that we should fight for. So just pause for a moment and think of at least one or two things that you would fight for. So if I came up to you after the service and said, hey, what, what, what would you fight for? Or what's worth fighting for? How would you answer that question? I think it's a good question. I think it's an honest question. And as we think about it this morning, there's a lot of things that I could say people fight for. Here are some that came to my mind. Some, some people fight for their marriage. That's a good thing. Some people will fight for their children. Some in our church, even as we speak today, are fighting for their health. It's a good fight. That's a hard fight. Some fight for the innocent. Two weeks from now on the 21st is Sanctity of Life Sunday. I invite you to come back for that where we will fight for the innocent. It's a passion I have. It's part of what what I want us to fight for, fight for the innocent. Some people fight for their country. Those of us that are believers, we fight for our faith. We fight for truth. There are a lot of good things that we fight for. Now, I don't know if you know this, but in the New Testament, there's a Greek word used for fight. It shows up eight times in the New Testament. That word is agonizome, agonizome. What English word do you think we get out of that? Ago, say it out loud. Agonize. We get agonized, right? That's the Greek word. It means to struggle. It means to strive. It means to contend. It means to fight. It carries a connotation of fighting with an adversity or competing intensely in a contest or fighting in a warfare. It's a powerful word, like I mentioned, used eight times in the New Testament. Now, it's not always translated as fight. And so as we introduce this concept of fighting, as we move into 2024, I want to put up on the screen for you the eight places that it shows up in the New Testament. But I've put the word in red because in English, it it doesn't always come out as fight. So let's start with Luke 13. It says strive or fight. To enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able to. Now, what I want you to notice with each of these verses is how this word fight is used and what we are as believers called to fight for. So just roll that through your mind as you look at these verses. John 18, 36, Jesus answered, said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were, were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. 1 Corinthians 9 says this, every athlete, or literally every fighter, every fighter exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. How about Colossians 1, 29? For this I toil or fight for this I fight struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me now I don't know about you but when I read that I'm thinking okay what is Paul fighting for what is he toiling for right what is it so well back up a verse not going to be on the screen but I'll read it to you here's the verse previous to 29 Paul says this he says Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Then he says, for this I fight. For this I toil. Do you see what what Paul's fighting for? He's fighting for the maturity of the believer. That's a worthy fight, right? He says, I'm preaching, I'm teaching, I'm doing it with all wisdom, but I'm fighting for the maturity of the believer of the believer. Look look at Colossians 4. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Jesus Christ, greets you, always struggling or fighting, here it is again, always fighting on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. What is he fighting for? Maturity, right? Just like Paul was. He says, I'm fighting for maturity, and now you can say it out loud. This is a two-way conversation. I'm not just going to be here listening to myself this morning, right? Here's the second question. Super easy. How is he fighting in this verse? Prayer. Good. One person got that right. Great. Look, Look at it. 
He says, I am fighting on your behalf in his prayers. So he's praying for the maturity of the believer, and that's a way to fight. Look at 1 Timothy 4. For to this end we toil and we strive, or we fight, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is our Savior of, of all people, especially those who believe. 1 Timothy 6 says this, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in your presence of many witnesses. And then we will end with 2 Timothy 4 says, and again, Paul saying to his younger brother, Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. So I don't know about you, but as I look at the eight places that this word fight shows up in the New Testament, I would say this, there's no such thing as easy believism. It's not there. You're not going to find it in Scripture. The Christian faith is an agonizing roll up your sleeve, get in the battle, get in the fight, take it seriously, and, and move forward or move against the culture, move against the lies of the enemy. Scripture calls us to that. It's not easy believism. It's not, hey, become a Christian, sit in your lazy boy lounge chair and watch the world go by knowing that your soul is safe and you'll end up in heaven and, and anything can happen. That's not how Christianity is described in the New Testament throughout all Scripture. Look what Paul says. He says this. He says, fight the good fight of faith. How does he describe the fight, good or bad? Thank you. It's okay to talk in church. Like, I like, it's okay. Relax. It's just church. You can talk. You can speak out loud. He describes it as a good fight. Fight the good fight for your faith. In other words, it's a worthy fight. It's a noble fight. It's an honorable fight. I would say this. I would go to, so far to say it's a beautiful fight. If you are an authentic Christ follower sitting in this room this morning, you're not only called to fight, it's a worthy, honorable, and beautiful fight for you to be in. I love the words of Paul and how he describes it. So as we begin this new year, as we begin 2024 as Southwest Community Church, today I'm going to focus on one of those honorable things that we can fight for, and primarily this morning we're talking about fighting for truth. Because I believe it's not only paramount to our Christian living, it also is super important because we see the continuing corruption and downfall of our modern culture and it's spinning out of control. So I believe God has called you and I as the Christian church to fight for truth to take it seriously, to know that we are in a battle, know that there is warfare going on, and respond with fighting for truth. So that's where we're going to start this morning. Just, and my encouragement to you is fight for truth. Fight for truth. Be a believer that fights for the truth of God's word. Let's be a church that will fight for truth. Now, we'll spend some time in the Gospel of John this morning because Jesus here begins a discussion. He's having like a discussion, maybe an argument with some Pharisees. They're going back and forth. He's talking to them. And then some of the Jews believe. They believe the Gospel. They believe Jesus is who he says he is, that he's, he's going to die on the cross for the sins of the world, and they believe. And then Jesus says this in John chapter 8, verse 31, 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who, who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Those are great words. Those are words of truth. Jesus turns his attention to the believers, the believing Jews specifically, and he says this. He's giving them the secret to life. Do you see the secret? He says, if you want to be a true follower of mine, if you want to be an authentic Christian, if you want to be a real disciple, he says, abide in my word. Abide in my word. If you abide in my word, then you're my disciple. You will know the truth and the truth will set you, say it out loud, free. free. There you go. Some of you just woke up. Welcome to church. 
Yeah, that truth will set you free, right? We are to abide in the truth as we abide, as we stay, as we focus on him and his word, that truth will set us free. And I love the word abide. It literally means to stay, to remain, to endure, to stand, take a stand. Jesus says, remain in my word, endure in my word, stand on my word, fight the culture with my word, with truth. It's really what he is saying. And I love the way Jesus speaks here. He is not saying that the requirement for becoming a disciple is obedience, right? Some people will try to tell you that, right? That, that it's, well, if you obey first, then you'll be saved. That's not at all what Jesus says here. He's not saying, if you continue in my word, you will become a genuine disciple. He says that the nature of a true disciple consists of continuing in obedience to his word and remaining in the truth. And we see that all throughout the New Testament. Matthew 12, 50, for, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Right? John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. John, 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. So obedience and standing to, on the word of God doesn't make you a Christian. You're a Christian and because you're a Christian, you have a love for God, you have a love for his word, you have a love for his truth. Therefore, you're going to apply it to your life. Let me say it like this. I'll put it on the screen so you don't miss it. Obeying the truth is not a means to salvation, but a proof that we possess authentic faith. Right? It's not a means to our salvation. We, we don't preach and teach a legalistic works programmatic to try to please God, to try to put a smile on God's face. face. We don't teach that at all. We teach the gospel, which is... I'm alive in Christ. He has made me alive in Christ. I love him enough to know his truth, know his word, and, as James says, be a doer of the word, not merely a hearer who will delude myself. So as you abide in the word, as you know God's truth, that truth will set you free. Free from what, you may ask? Well, free from your sin, free from ourselves, free from the lies of the age. So fight for truth. We need to fight for truth. I want everyone to answer this next question super easy, not a trick question. Answer it out loud. What is the opposite of truth? Lies. Lies. You're exactly right. See, the opposite of truth is lies, so if we're going to fight for truth, we must be aware of lies. Be aware of lies. As children of God who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we have the discernment within us to, to understand truth from lie. And, and our culture does a really good job, and false religions do a really good job of trying to meld the two together where you can't discern. But guess what? The Holy Spirit and the genuine believer knows a truth from a lie and a lie from a truth. Let me ask you another important question. Where do lies come from? What is the origin? Satan himself. The very enemy of God. See, here's a problem in our world and in our culture today. We like to point to other groups and say that they are the origin of the lies. Right? So, so we like to pick out groups and say, oh, this group is pounding, pounding on this drum, so they're the origin of the lie. Or, or this political view is the origin of the lie. And we like to point the people to the origin. That is not at all biblical. That is not at all true. What is truth is every lie has its origin based and birth in Satan himself. Because that's why he exists. If you don't believe me, look at John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. No truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. 
So as you and I navigate the corrupt, twisted world in which we live, don't point to people as the origin or groups of people as the origin that are promoting these lies. You have to look behind that and go, it's Satan himself. He is the enemy of God. He is the enemy of righteousness and he is the enemy of truth. He is the father of lies and has a character of lies and that's from which he speaks. So if we're going to fight Christians for truth, know who, know who our enemy truly is. Now again, do people get wrapped up and deceived into these lies and they feel like maybe they're our enemy? Sometimes that happens, but they're, they're truly not your enemy. The enemy is behind that. Satan himself. And Satan, as we know, his desire is to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan is real. He exists to steal truth in your life. He exists to kill your faith and to destroy your very soul. Mark it down. It's reality. It's truth. Enemy of God, we are at war. We are in a spiritual warfare. My prayer for Southwest Community Church going into 2024 is that we take on a wartime mentality. We get out of our comfortable, pathetic, apathetic chairs, lazy boys, and we get up and we fight. And we fight for truth. And fighting many times means we have a voice and we get uncomfortable and someone may look at us or judge us in a certain way. I'm sure I'm going to get all kinds of comments after this weekend. Flooded. My email will be flooded tomorrow morning, guaranteed. But you know what? If God loved me enough to show me his grace to save me, then he's called me to fight for his kingdom and to fight for his truth, and he's called you to do the exact same thing. Regardless of what the culture says about us. Regardless of the heat you might take to stand for truth. So I'm asking this church this year to join me in fighting for truth in very real and very practical and very uncomfortable ways. Whether you realize it or not, we're at war. We have a real enemy. Paul understood this concept. Look at, look at Ephesians 6. He says this, Finally, brothers, sisters, Christians, finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the, against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We are in a spiritual warfare. And this is the time for believers to take up the offensive and fight. Now, if we put on the whole armor, I don't know if you've read that passage in Ephesians, but the whole armor is 99% offense, defensive. It's all defensive. There's one piece that's offense. Which is it? It's the sword. It's the word. Right? We We have one offensive piece. And so Paul says, fight with your sword, unsheathe it, get it out, wheel it in the world in which you live. To fight for truth means that we not only abide in the truth, but we wield our swords effectively because the sword is the truth of God's word. See, I believe we're called to have tough conversations Don't forget, I just spent three years in one of the largest, most secular universities in the nation. You want to do a fight? Step on a college campus. You want to fight against the lies of the world and the ways of the culture? Step on any secular campus anywhere in the United States. That's where where a lot of the fight takes place. You're going to have to be in some uncomfortable conversations. You're going to have to learn to love people with very, very different views than you for the sake of the gospel. But I don't know about you, but I want to be part of that kind of church. A, that's not afraid to get in the fight, but B, does it in love and grace and the way Jesus would do it. That's a church I want to be a part of. That's that's a group I want to hook arms with and go into battle with. So if the opposite of truth is lies, 
you and I live in a world that's constantly bombarding us with lies. I, I'm just going to spend a few short minutes on what I would consider the top cultural lies in our society right now. And again, understand that this is probably a long sermon series I could take each one of these and preach a message on. I'm not going to do that today, but I did want to give them to you, put them in your notes, put them in your hands so that you take them home and you are aware of the lies the enemy is trying to sell you daily in the world and culture in which we live. So I'm just going to introduce these briefly. Number one, there's lies of identity. Lies of identity. See, see, the world wants you to see yourself for someone other than who God created you to be. And so I believe there's an identity crisis in our world and in our culture. And so if you and I are going to fight for truth, we're going to fight for who God made you to be. And you will begin to see yourself as God sees you, not as the world wants to mold you into something else. So there's lies of identity. Number two, lies of racism. It's running rampant in our world, in our own country. As believers of Jesus Christ, as authentic believers, I don't know about you, but at the foot of the cross, we are all dead equal. Every single one of us. See, Christ died for every tongue, every nation, every ethnicity. For the cross, we're all equal. But see, there are lies out there in our culture right now that say, that's saying, you know, racism is real. How about lies of abortion? Two weeks from now, Sanctity of Life, I will be preaching on this because I'm going bold and, and, and we're going to fight for truth. But there are lies out there that, that will tell you lies about when birth happens and when it happens and how we can excuse it away. And it's just a medical procedure. False, 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 false. If we don't fight for the innocent, then who are we? What kind of men and women are we? If we don't fight for those who have no voice, if we don't become a voice for those who have no voice, who are we? We're weak, pathetic Christians. We need to stand and take a stand. Innocent lives are being lost. Teenagers are getting twisted. Medical procedures are being done to our young because they bought the lie of, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not who I was born to be. This brings us to a couple more lies. Sorry, I'm getting a little crazy. I'm passionate about this stuff. This one's been going on forever. Uh, lies of homosexuality. We have lies of genderism. Again, people believing that they're born something that they're not. God gives us life. He's the author and sustainer of life. He creates us. He knits us together in our mother's womb perfectly to be the perfect representation of who he designed us to be for his glory. And if we try to change that, then we become God. God. Last time I checked, last time I looked in the mirror, I wasn't God. And neither are you. Spoiler alert. And then lastly, lies of religion. There's false religions out there that will take a little bit of truth and a little bit of lie. They'll mix them together. They'll come up with some kind of fancy little recipe that, gets it, that makes it super hard to discern truth from lie. But they're selling a false gospel. Selling a false Jesus. And we must be aware of the lies of religion. So the enemy is hard at work in our world. He's selling us lies. He, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy, Scripture says. With these lies, he's stealing truth from the weak-minded. He is killing marriages, families, and entire communities, and I would say entire countries with his lies. He is destroying the very fabric of society and slowly turning people from the true God to the false gods thereby destroying the souls of millions. And he does it with lies. Now, we've looked at Romans 1 before, but I, I could not preach this message without reminding you of the power of Romans 1 and, and what happens when we suppress the truth, when people suppress the truth. Look at Romans 1, 18. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. This is our world. If you and I are Christians and if we're going to fight for truth, understand that the enemy is using individuals to suppress the truth. Ungodly people, unrighteous people, people that do not know God, people that do not know his truth, they don't know his love, they don't know his grace, they don't even understand his wrath, but they are working hard to suppress the truth. So if you go on in Romans, look at what happens. Go down to verses 21 22. For although they knew God, they did not honor him or give him thanks, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise, they became fools. Does that sound familiar or not in the world in which you and I live in today? See, the way this is written tells us that some of the Romans knew of the one true God. They knew of him, but they didn't know him. They didn't have an intimate relationship with him. Therefore, they didn't honor him. They didn't give him thanks. They knew of God, but did not turn to him. They did not follow him. They did not truly believe in him and his word. And because of this, it says God gave them over to their futile minds. Right? There's a limit to God's grace. You want to ignore him, you want to turn your back, you want to cuss him out, you, you want to suppress the truth, he'll show you grace for a long time, but there's going to be a day, just like Romans tells us, says, you know what, I'm going to give them over to their foolishness. You want to be a fool? Knock yourself out. How many parents can relate to that? <laughs> right? You're going to continue to be a fool? Go ahead, man, I've spoken as much truth as I can for as long as I can. So interesting. Romans says this. He gave them over to their foolish hearts because they were darkened. They were claiming to be wise, yet became fools. How did God respond to that? Keep going on. Romans 1. Great chapter. Look at verse 24, 25. Therefore, since all that is true, right? Since, since people are suppressing the truth, since they're not honoring God, they're not giving him thanks, they, they, they have foolish hearts. Look, look what happens. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to the impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Does this describe our world or not? To a T. This is the world we're living in. Do you see the progression? Look at the progression of Romans chapter 1. When people suppress the truth, they become futile in their thinking, and then they become fools. And when you're a fool, how does a fool live? Well, they exchange the truth of God for a lie, and then once they step over that line... They dishonor their bodies and they worship the creature rather than the creator. There's a progression here. And I don't have time to go through it today, but if you read the rest of that chapter, you would get very specific examples of what these people do with their minds and their bodies. Let me give you just a window. If you read the rest, see, once we suppress the truth, then we lose our minds, we become fools, we dishonor our body, and, and here's what Scripture says. It says, men and women exchange natural relations for unnatural. They are filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit. Malice, they are gossips, they are slanders, they are haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedience to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. That's what happens to a world, to a people, to a society when we suppress the truth. So either you're with me and we're going to fight for truth or we're just going to sit back in our lounge chairs and watch it all happen. I'm going to fight. I choose to fight. I hope many of you, all of you, (laughs) would choose to fight. See, do you see why we need a church that teaches the Bible? Do you see why we need a church that'll pick a book like we are, 1 Peter, and we go verse by verse, word by word, because that's truth? Do you see why we need a church that's focused on discipleship? 
a church that's gonna, gonna encourage deep community and real conversations, a church that's committed to biblical counseling for people who need that, a church that's committed to growing and fighting for the maturity of our believers, a church that's committed to support Christian education, whether it's homeschool, whether it's Christian school at any level and come alongside parents that have their kids in public school to fight for truth. See, we need a church that will fight for truth at every Every level for all people because truth matters. And guess what? Our souls matter. And the souls of our kids matter. And if we don't teach them truth, who's going to? If, if we don't disciple them, who's going to? If the church doesn't take up and take a stand for truth, I'm telling you, the world's not going to do it. And scripture says we need one another to do it. We need to fight together. So how do we do that? How do we fight? I'm going to end with some very, very practical things. And then I'm going to put a challenge out to the church. Got some big challenges today because I'm coming in 2024 swinging. Right? I, 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 am, I just am. I'm done playing church. I've, I've done church for a lot of years. Done playing. Done sitting. Done. I want my life, I want the church that I lead to count for the glory of God. I want him to look at this place 10 years from now and say, you know what? Those people were bold. They swam uphill against culture, but they stood for my truth and I blessed them because of it. That's the God I serve, that's the church I want to serve. How do we fight for truth? Six quick suggestions. I could give you probably 20. I'll give you six. Constantly attend a Bible teaching church. If this isn't your home church and you don't live here, please, I pray for you, find a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. Now, guess what? Every church will say we're Bible-believing. Every church says it. But when you show up on Sunday, do they open this up and do they teach it verse by verse, word by word, or do they pick and choose what they're going to teach? Right? Go to a Bible-teaching church. Number two, read the Bible. Read the Bible daily. And, and if you're new to reading the Bible, read a verse. Read a couple of verses. Read a little chapter. A lot of us have an app. Uh, we have a, uh, this app here, the Holy Bible app, has a lot of reading plans. You can go to that app. I use it myself. I read through the Bible every year. My encourage for you, if you've never done that, do it. I had a friend of mine nine years ago that says, hey, Arne, have you ever read all the way through the Bible? I said, well, yeah, maybe once or twice. He's like, how about if you do it every year for the next 10 years? I fell off my chair like we were having lunch. I mean, what? Two weeks ago, I started year number 10. And it is changing my life. Because I'm seeing the world and I'm seeing the church through his eyes, not my own. And I'm a pastor, right? Like, like, like I, should know, I should know that. Get in God's word. Fight for truth by getting in his word. Number three, participate in a Bible study. Not only get in his word, talk about it. Get in a community where you can talk about it. You can ask questions. Number four, memorize the Bible. Right? Just, just start memorizing simple little verses. Add to it. I already told you we're adding something new this year on your note sheet, and it'll be in our weekly email. Take one of these. We have what I'm calling monthly fighter verse. You can start with there. Well, what do I memorize? Memorize this. Right? Every week for this month, this same verse will be there. It'll be in our monthly email. And then next month, it'll change. And so we're going to have 12 verses. I'm going to call them fighter verses because we're going to fight for truth all year long. Number five, speak the truth in love. I can't speak the truth in love unless I'm in community with people. Right? Truth has got to come out of our mouths as Christians. And then lastly, number six, pray for a spiritual revival. Ever since I became the lead pastor of this church a little bit over a year ago, I regularly pray for spiritual revival, for a spiritual awakening. And some people don't know what that is or what that looks like, so we have a resource for you. For the next 10 days, J.I. Packard writes in his works, The Glory of God and the Reviving of Religion, and in his writing, he describes 10 elements of a spiritual revival. 
And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you can put this in your hand, there should have been this on your seat or on a seat next to you. It's uh, it's called fight the good fight. And here's the challenge church. Here's what we're going to do for the next 10 days. The staff has come up with this, a simple, maybe little 10 minute devotion. Within that, you have a concept, a scripture to read and a way to apply it. And so I'm going to challenge the church today for the next 10 days, do one of these devotions. And then on the 10th day, which happens to be January 17th, which is our Wednesday night, one thing, worship and prayer meeting, I'm going to ask the entire church, I'm calling for a church-wide fast that day, that Wednesday on the 17th, and I want you to pray for revival. And then when you come here at 6 p.m., we're going to start with prayer, and we're going to have 10 stations highlighting these 10 things. We'll spend five minutes at each station. You can rotate. The room will be set up. I invite the entire church to be here for that. We will spend 50 minutes praying for revival with each one of these steps, and then we will end our night with breaking our fast and eating because you'll be hungry by that. I'm just saying. But join me in praying for a spiritual fast. So what does is, what is revival look like? Or join me in praying for a spiritual revival. Join me that day. And some of us on staff are going to fast three days. You can, and, and again, I don't have time to go into the biblical teaching of what a fast is. I'll let you figure that out. I would say on that Wednesday, give something up. If it's coffee, if it's chocolate, heaven forbid, not chocolate. But what, what, whatever it is, give it up. For me and for some of the staff, we're going to be fasting completely Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, leading into that Wednesday night. I would encourage you to do that, praying for spiritual revival and that we would be a church that fights for truth. What is spiritual revival? Quick 10 things. These come from J.I. Packard. Number one, God comes down in a very real sense. God's word pierces the hearts of men and women and children. Man's sin is seen. We call sin for what it is. Christ's cross is valued. Change goes deep. It's lasting change. This is spiritual revival. Love breaks out. Seven, he says, Satan keeps pace. Let, let, let me just pause there. You know what this means? Church, get ready. When you pray for revival, does Satan want that? Yes or no? No. no. Do you think he's going to respond? Yes or no? Yes. yes. He's going to keep pace. He's going to fight. I've been praying for spiritual revival my first year at this church. Do you think it's been easy or difficult? I've I've taken my hits because the enemy is going to keep pace. So don't be surprised. I wasn't surprised by it. Don't be surprised. I say bring it on because my God's bigger than you. Right? I'm already on the winning team. He's the victor. In the whole story, I know the end of the story. He wins. And as Christ followers, so do we, number eight, each church becomes itself. In other words, we take on our own unique part of the body of Christ and we become fighters together. And then the lost are found. People are giving their lives to Christ. And lastly, joy fills our hearts. So as we conclude our service this morning, we're going to do so with communion. I would encourage you, to spend a few moments in prayer. You might want to pray for spiritual revival. And and hear this, people. Does revival start at a church or in individual hearts? Individual hearts. So maybe your prayer this morning before you take communion is very simple. God, revive my heart. Create a new spirit in me. Do something in me. Wake me up. Get me off the couch spiritually. And then whenever you're ready, we've got stations all around the room. Just make your way to one of those stations, whether you do it individually, as a couple, as a family. Take communion together. Remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He calls us to fight for truth. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread, drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So God, we come before you this morning, and my prayer for this church is that we would experience a spiritual revival like none other. That you would do your work, your time, your way, your pace, all for your glory. 
and hearts would be filled, our hearts would be so filled with joy because we see you working in very real and dynamic and supernatural ways, which will humble us and take attention off of us and put it on you. And that's our prayer. So Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice of your blood and your body that we are remembering in this moment. May we be a church, may we be a people that fight for truth. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Take as much time as you need. When you're ready, join, join us in communion and then we'll sing at the closing after everyone's had communion. God bless you, thanks for being here. We'll see you next week. our service today I'd like to just have us draw our attention to Romans 8 verse 15 I love this verse for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters of God by whom we cry out Abba Father so I invite you to stand let's just celebrate that Christ has reconciled us and set us free sing together how great the chasm how great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and 
spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living could imagine so great a mercy what I could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Oh, hallelujah, praise the one who sent me. Sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave it has no claim on me. Let's sing that again. Come on. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Yeah. Jesus, yours is the I just want to invite you today, if you're here and you'd like somebody to pray with you, if God is 
working in your life, if you have a need, I invite you to come forward. We do have some folks here who would love to pray with you. But uh, I pray that you guys have a wonderful afternoon, a wonderful week, that God's peace and grace will be with you as you fight for truth. It's been a pleasure worshiping with you. Have a great day.